fascinating part of the human body that differentiates us from all other species is the brain. In fact, the brain is the crown jewel of the human body. It is the source of all the qualities that define our humanity. It is nature's gift that we have this incredible CPU, central processing unit, that processes life itself. Don't you think that it's amazing that we can think about our own thinking? And thanks to neuroscience, we can even learn about the way we learn. Today, I'd like to share with you my personal journey as an educator over 20 years. I've done an extensive amount of research in neuroscience, psychology, and education. I started as a student of psychology and then went on to education administration. And what I found was a beautiful union of psychology and education in something known as brain-compatible learning, also known as brain-based learning. And today, I'd like to see myself in the role of a humble synthesizer with the great work that already psychologists, neuroscientists, and educators have done. I have just collected it and tried to see what are the most important things that we need to remember from this to apply to teaching digital natives today. <clears throat> Given the dynamic nature of teaching and learning, I'd like to suggests that this can be a hard science that we can use to make our practices more professional and do those things in a way that would be effective. And it's going to arm ourselves with a greater deal of confidence. Now, how can we use brain-compatible learning as an upgrade application of the teaching and learning context? In the 21st century, we all know that we need to equip our students today with all the C's that include creativity, communication, collaboration, critical thinking skills, and let's not forget character. But how is brain-compatible learning going to help us achieve this? Actually, today, all adults, teachers and parents alike, we have a challenge in teaching the digital native because as a human being within four walls, we are quite boring compared to the virtual world that is filled with pop-ups and loads of multimedia effects. Somehow we just can't compete with that and we're a little bit boring. So how is it that we can retain the children's attention? How can we challenge them, enrich them? How can we touch, move and inspire them and motivate them? These are all questions that I'd like to propose that brain-compatible learning may have an answer. In fact, Eric Jensen, who is the author of Brain-Compatible Teaching Strategies, he says that we need to teach with the brain in mind. In fact, when we can all learn how we learn, we're all going to get smarter in life, he says. And from neuroscience, we know a lot of wonderful things now that we didn't know before. Things like neuroplasticity, how all our experiences that our children are experiencing, even adults are experiencing, they're actually physically changing the circuitry of our brain. And we know now from neuroscience that neurons are fired together, wired together, and compose our circuitry. Today, I'd like to use an ABC format to set a foundation for brain-compatible learning. That is, attention retention, body-mind connection, and challenging the learner. To start off with, A, how do we get the children's attention in the digital age? It's challenging enough that we cannot um, take them away from their smart devices and their uh, digital platforms. Um, but I'd like for all of you to consider and ask yourselves, what is it that I can do as a human being in our human interaction that a smart device cannot, or a computer cannot? How can I touch and move and inspire children in this human interaction? I'd like to share with you something that is not new. In fact, it's very ancient. It's a Chinese proverb. I'm sure you all have heard of it. What I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, I understand. Taking the second part of it, the digital world offers us a lot of images. 
And I'm not saying that technology is bad. There's a lot of amazing images, and in fact, videos that help aid comprehension. We can use that. There is a place for technology. But according to research, we need to understand that learning from visuals, retention from visuals, is only about 20%. What do we do with the rest of the 80%? How do we bridge learning as a human being in this era, in this digital era? What do we do to keep the children's attention? Well, what does the brain suggest as far as attention is concer concerned? Um, the brain, we need to remember, is like a sieve. There's millions of bits of information that are coming in through the senses every second. Of course, the brain doesn't pay attention to everything, right? The brain basically filters out that, what is, that which is meaningful to the brain. In fact, what fits into the larger schema? What is a piece of information that fits into the larger pattern of what I already know? So the brain is meaning driven. That's the first thing that we need to understand. Secondly, the brain thrives and survives with feedback. When we give feedback, the brain helps us pay attention to it. OK? And the other thing that we need to remember is the brain is also looking for a real world connection or real world relevance to see how this new piece of information can fit in with what I know enhance and enhance my understanding of the world. Another thing that we need to remember is that novelty sparks attention. In fact, it even ignites curiosity. And last but not least, emotions drive our attention as well as our memory. And it makes learning very meaningful. Moving on to B, we need to understand the body-mind connection. Very essential. And we need to understand that movement actually embeds learning. Um, and we see from this visual over here how active learning methods increase retention compared to passive learning methods. What happens is that brain motor areas, they benefit from multimodal activities because they link the visual, the tactile, and the spatial and auditory skills that one is exposed to. And interactive learning actually utilizes the body much more than a sedentary experience does. And when kids are in front of a screen, it's a very passive experience. But interactive learning is not. So that's an advantage that we have. In fact, the more ways that you teach, we need to remember the more children you reach. And whether it is drawing from Montessori, Waldorf, or even Dr. Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, all of these philosophies or methodologies of learning, they endorse active learning. Next, we need to remember that learning is best when it's multisensorial. In fact, when you get the body involved in the learning process, that really boosts learning. We need to pay attention to a couple of things, because they say that you are what you eat. So paying attention to nutrition is important, also where you spend your time. Anything that is natural, natural materials, natural habitat, um, these are all good for us. Next, we have a lot of evidence from research that endorses how exercise and sports, it boosts learning and memory and retention. Okay? And in the classroom, you can use games and play to pep up learning, even a fun ball toss or a pass the parcel revision. These are all things that are going to help our memory and cognition better. Um, and when there's a lot of sitting time or there's a lot of, you know, sort of sedentary um, experience, it's always nice to use a brain gym activity, a kinesthetic energizer that's just going to kind of pep you up when you're learning in the classroom as well. Next, C, how do we create a challenging but non-threatening atmosphere for the learner? And there's a couple of things that I'm going to share drawing from psychology and education. But first of all, we need to understand what is the right level of challenge. Because if you give too much challenge, it's intimidating. And too little challenge means boredom. In fact, according to brain research, about 75% of your brain will shut down from stress, whether it's real or perceived. 
Because what happens is that it activates the fight or flight mode, and that blurs your thinking capacity, which is in your frontal cortex. Now, we also understand about challenging is that the brain actually craves novelty, stimulation, and change. But unfortunately, as adults, we need to remember that most of us adults, we crave control and predictability. And that's not very exciting for children. So that's just something to keep in mind. So I'd like to share with you one example from psychology, starting with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We know that in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have the top, which is the um, self-actualization, at the bottom is your physiological needs. Somewhere in the middle is your intellectual needs. Now, what is very important for us to understand as parents and as educators is what precedes intellectual needs, okay? So moving from your physical, physiological needs are your safety needs. And it's not just physical safety that I'm referring to, I'm also talking about emotional safety. How emotionally safe does your child feel in your, feel in your company? Secondly, need for belonging. How inclusive is the adult? How do you make the child feel that it's safe to approach this adult and that I am a part of this, whether it's a classroom or envi home environment, learning environment? After that is your need for self-esteem. How is the adult making the child feel about their capacity to learn and to move on to the next level. Are we encouraging? Are we building self-esteem? So these are all the things that precede learning. So if kids aren't learning, we need to ask ourselves, are we missing something here in this hierarchy? The next example that I'd like to share is Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. He says that there is an area that you can do on your own for a child, and then there's an area or a skills that you can learn with the help of an adult, and that's the zone of proximal development. Now, we need to understand, as an adult, what is the zone of proximal development? This is the area where the teacher or the parent can facilitate and scaffold so that the child can move to the next learner, uh, to the next level. And also, we need to remember that Vygotsky is a social cultural psychologist. And that means that he suggests things like transmitting culture, values, customs, skills to the next generation. This is really something that belongs to the human interaction that we can do as adults. It's not something that they're going to learn from technology passively. So we do have a role to play. Now, the last example for C I'd like to share with you is from Bloom's Taxonomy, and educators would know this very well, that there is lower order thinking skills and then there's higher order thinking skills, also known as critical thinking. And we know that memorization of information is not something that is gonna be useful in the 21st century. It's not about what you know, it's about what do you know, what, what can we do with the information that we know? How can we take information that we learn, how can we apply it, analyze it, synthesize it, evaluate it, create from it? That's what's important in the 21st century. And information is readily available to everybody now. It's just, you know, you can just look it up, you can Google anything. So it's not about how much information, it's about what you can do with the information. And secondly, parents and educators, we need to be able to ask the right questions. The right level of, uh, right questions that take the child, the learner to the next level and challenge them to skills or ways in which to use the knowledge that they did not know how to do before. So basically this ABC format that I've just shared with you right now, I propose this as an application that we can use um, these info nuggets from neuroscience, from brain compatible learning, and we can apply it to our teaching and learning practices. And it's gonna arm us with a greater deal of confidence and effectiveness when we're dealing with a digital native. And um, that's to conclude the ABCs of brain compatible learning. Thank you very much.